Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I like that greeting over here. Well, if you can hear me out in the foyer, start making your way in. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Uh, glad you all are here today. I'm excited this time of year. Um, school's out. Summer has started, kind of. Tell the temperature that. But uh, we, uh, we pray for uh, rain and uh, just a great Sunday uh, that we can spend together. Have lots of people out of town this weekend. Uh, pray for safe travel for them. Um, well, let me get into the announcements here this morning. Um, the new Operation Christmas Child uh, um, fun deal I hear is, I, I mess this up first service, this is hard for me, Rub-A-Dub-Dub help fill the tub. So there's a, there's a, a water tank out there, and uh, Justin said this morning, that is not our new baptismal, um, but please do fill that. Uh, this, this time for the shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, our uh, hygiene items, uh, soap, shampoo, brushes, uh, different things like that that will fit in the shoe boxes. So um, talk, to, talk to Sherry and their crew about what all they need. Also, make your nominations for elders and deacons. That is through the end of this month. Uh, there's some sheets out there when you first come in, and you can put them in those boxes. Baby bottles for life. We started this on Mother's Day. We'll end on Father's Day, June 19th. So take one of the bottles out there and uh, fill it up, uh, not with milk, uh, but with uh, some uh, change or some uh, dollars or something and pray over it. Bring it back to the church and we'll give that back to, to Baby Balls for Life. Also, uh, Barb Runke has a card out there uh, and you can get signed up for this or sign up to get to register to vote. For also the value of them both, uh, vote yes uh, on August 2nd. And you can get more information uh, out there for that. The fifth Sunday offering uh, will be on May 29th. Be the Samaritan's Purse to help the Ukrainian people. Absolutely, Jim. Um, the Heart of Addiction is a new Bible study that's going to start uh, starting May 31st down in the Fellowship Hall uh, with Kevin White. Get with him and Louie. Um, and so they're going to get that going here in just a short period of time. So excited about that. Um, the 2022 Norton Survivors Garden will be Wednesday, June 1st at 4 p.m. at the Norton County Courthouse Lawn. Get a hold of Carolyn Plot. She's got the cards right there uh, for more information on that. All right, the uh, Norton Rural Fire Department, uh, they're going to be having a benefit supper on Friday, June 3rd. Please sign up to bring a side dish. And uh, hey, thank you, firefighters, for uh, all you've done the last month. Uh, forever. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, the, uh, the Norton Christian Church Fellowship and Fish Fry will be Saturday, June 11th, 6 o'clock p.m. out at the lake at the pavilion. Also, Lakeview Camp registration is open. Uh, Heather and Natalie have a table set up out there if you want to sign up today. Also, you can sign up online. The first and second graders leave less than a month from now to go to camp, so pretty excited about that. Get signed up. Remember, the, the church does pay half of the tuition for your student. CIY final prices uh, are available. Get a hold of us for that. We're excited. I think we're full for CIY. Um, head there in July. So we're, we're excited about that because we get to do Jesus and the University of Nebraska campus all in one, so go Big Red. <laughs> All right, the scripture reading today, uh, a couple things, actually, before I get to that, Cabbage Ball uh, is this afternoon. We have a game at 3 o'clock and a game at 4 o'clock, uh, so come down and watch, and if there's some spaces available you want to play, you can sure jump in there and do that. So, um, Also, Justin Brody, Justin and Amanda Brody and their family are here today. They are uh, candidates for our youth minister position, and uh, he will be giving the communion meditation today. So if you see a new face up here, that's him. You probably already met him. Uh, there's also, after this service, out in the foyer, uh, they'll be out there if you want to stop and visit with them for a little bit. We're excited to have them here today. Um, all right, let's get to the scripture reading today. So we're in 1 Peter 2, uh, verses 1 through 6. Yeah, please stand for the reading of God's Word. You are coming to Christ. Oh, hold on, sorry. I'm in the wrong place here. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk 
so that you will go into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for the nourishment, now that you know you have the taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is a living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Once more, you are holy priests. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Hey, why don't you all turn to your neighbors and say hello this morning? <laughs>
You are just so good, and we are so, so blessed and so grateful to be able to meet here with our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. And God, we just want to ask that you just move through every single piece of today at church, Father. We don't want to come through those doors and just go through the motions and have this be just another Sunday morning where we get to see uh, the people that we know, God, but we want to see you above all else, Father, whether it be through the music that we sing, through the scripture that we read, uh, through the sermon that is said, Father, we pray that we are just a lens to your throne room, that you are the one that is seen through all of it, Father. So we pray that you just soften our hearts, open our eyes and our ears to see what you have for us and receive what you have for us this morning, that we can be moved and transformed by you and your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we ask all of these things. Amen.
build my life. Good morning, church. If you're watching uh, online, I want to welcome our viewers. If you're watching at home, then this would be the time to get your communion preparations ready as we partake here in a little bit. So, yeah, my family and I were grateful to be here in Norton. Uh, we got into town at 2.30 this morning. None of you guys were awake at 2.30 this morning. We were expecting, like, you know, a welcome to Norton parade or something. You know, Nate lied to it. Just kidding. It is good to be here, and you'll get a chance to meet my girls if you haven't. Uh, my oldest had a dance recital last night that uh, went a little late, so we, we got started up here, and we're so glad to be here. Um, man, there's so much that happens around this time of the year with Mother's Day and graduations and just a lot of, a lot of moving pieces and parts to finishing up the school year and getting ready for the summer. It just kind of made me think a little bit about the time that I graduated high school, and I go back to that night and uh, grew up in Ames, Iowa, Central Iowa, or Iowa State University. Uh, so, you know, I'll be the only Cyclone fan in Norton County, uh, probably. Um, so uh, that's, that's okay. It's not much different in Oklahoma. Um, so I remember our graduating class was over 550 students. It was a big class, and I was so excited uh, to get my diploma. I was so excited to get that diploma, you know, open up that folder and see my diploma. I'd worked so hard for it. So we're, we're waiting for our names to be called. And we go up on stage and we get that diploma. And I go back to my seat and I open up the folder and it's blank. I was like, what kind of like trick is this? Like, did I, did I fail? I was like, I, I thought like I didn't graduate. And really all we had to do is we had to go wait till everybody was done and find our homeroom teacher and turn in our graduation robes before we actually got our diploma. But I remember how excited I was to see that diploma with my name on it. I worked so hard for that. And, and you know, there's other things in our lives that we have that our names are on it that have value to us, that mean something to us. Um, I have my cubbies handbook from when I was a little cubby in Awana. My Sparks book, I still have that with my name on it. Um, it, it, it just has a, a certain sentimental value when I see that and my name is written there. And maybe you have some things like that in your uh, home, some accolades or some awards that you've won. Uh, when they put your name on something, it, it has value and it has meaning. And I got to thinking, the more I was 
kind of disappointed that my diploma was empty. There was nothing inside. But then I got, as I thought about that, I got to thinking, man, you know, so many of these accolades, so many of these things that we celebrate, you know, birthdays, graduations, retirements, things that we would get maybe plaques or awards for that has our name on it, that special meaning, they're only earthly things. They're all earthly things that only have earthly value and no eternal value. There's only one thing that I've found that has eternal value that I want to see my name written into. And that is in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And because when you read Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says, if your name is not in that book, it's not going to be good for you. It said, if your name is not to be found in the Lamb's book of life, that you will be cast into the lake of fire. And the reason why I bring that up at our communion time is because sometimes in the moments that are happening around us, we get so caught up in our life's achievements and the accolades and the things that are on our calendar that are coming up. I know I've already visited with several this morning that have weddings that are coming up and, and you've got summer plans and vacations. And sometimes the focus can, can get off of Christ at this moment and can be put on ourselves. I think that's why in Luke chapter 9 we read what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for, for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? So as we approach this table, this supper time, it is about Jesus. It's about what he did for you and for me on the cross. Nothing more, nothing less. And if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if your name is written in that book of life, then we have a reason to celebrate. And when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, Take up your cross daily and follow me. It's because that's what's most important, is where we spend eternity and who we take with us in eternity. Let's pray. Father, we come to this special time of our worship service where we gather for the supper that you instituted with your disciples. You, you passed the emblems and you told the disciples that this was your body that was broken for them to take and eat, that the cup that you passed was the cup of the new covenant and your blood that you passed and told them to drink and whenever we do these things to remember you so that's what we're doing right now that I just pray that we would clear our minds any of thoughts that we have about what the work week looks like and what our schedules are looking like what's what's going to be for lunch any of those things that are in our heads that would clear those thoughts and put all of our focus on you Jesus thank you for dying on the cross so that our names could be written in the Lamb's book of life it's in your son Jesus name we pray Amen.
pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I just want to just want to say thank you for all that you've done for us, our church, me and my wife, and um, I just, I'm just blessed and uh, I'm thankful for the Brody family and I wish and pray for safe travels for those when they go back home. I pray for this offering that uh, you accept it as our gratitude and appreciation for all that you've done. May you use it for portion for your kingdom, for the church. Um, it's in your name I pray. Amen. It's time to dismiss for Kids Quest an extended session. We're in a series of sermons on reaching new levels of faith, and last week we talked about um, imitation faith, and this week we're going to be talking about uh, affiliated faith, and we're talking about our whole theme for the year, which is um, charging forward in faith. But before we get there, uh, I do want to make a couple announcements that Garrett forgot, and I can't believe Garrett forgot this, and Doyle, you need to announce, and I can't believe AIM forgot this. I'm just disappointed in AIM. I, I tell you what, we might want to kick him out of the church. Doyle, would you like to stand up and announce the most important announcement you have uh, today? Would you, would you announce that? Woo! <laughs> do, do you, and more important, do you know the, the measurements? Because that's, that's what we care about. I mean... Best looking baby you've ever seen. All right. All right. Congratulations. And uh, uh, we got a call yesterday from Jody Taylor. They were awful nervous. Their new little baby, Cooper Wyatt, um, their daughter Jordan had to have a C-section. And uh, when Cooper was born, they couldn't regulate his heart rate, couldn't regulate his temperature. From, so from Holdridge, they had to airlift him to Kearney. And they said, would you please start praying? And so we sent out a, a, a message, please start praying. And they said as soon as they put him in the helicopter and they were shipping him off, everything regulated. And so he's doing wonderful. And uh, they sent me a picture of little Cooper. And uh, Mike was so happy. And Grandpa Mike, first grandbaby. And I looked at him. I said, oh, even a better blessing and miracle. He doesn't look like you, Mike. <laughs> uh, so uh, what a wonderful blessing that is as well. So uh, what a great um, thing. So uh, got a lot of... Uh, Blessings. We do have a, something to break our heart. Uh, this is uh, the Sauter's last Sunday with us. Uh, they're moving to Ohio. And so they're taking, you're taking your kids or are they staying with us? No, we'll, we'll keep them. We'll keep them. So uh, this is their last Sunday. He's taking a position up in Ohio. So uh, we, we, we hate to see you guys leave, but uh, uh, you've been a wonderful asset to our community. And thank you for being here. And uh, say bye to them on, on their way today when you're leaving. So affiliated faith is what we're talking about. Um, I, I want, what I want us to see is these really, uh, what we're going through my pinky's not working. Uh, what we're going through is the idea of where are you at in your walk with the Lord? Last week we talked about an imitation faith, and, and the idea is you, you think you're following Jesus Christ, but are you, or is it just an outer shell? And when it is tested, your faith's going to bust. And this is an affiliated faith, and, and we as parents, we are responsible for teaching our kids about Jesus Christ, about God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and throughout the Old Testament, God tells the Israelites, your responsibility as parents is to tell them about me 
And you get into Joshua, at the end of uh, the book of Joshua, it says, and there was raised a generation after they saw with their own eyes what the Lord had done, for all these miraculous things that God had did. They saw it with their own eyes. And that generation died off, and, and there was raised a generation that didn't know God or the acts thereof. How is that possible? They didn't do what God commanded them to do. You know, I, I believe that it is the mom and dad's job to educate the child, and it's the school's responsibility to come alongside the parents. But what we have done is we turn it over. When you allow the school to do it, what you've done, you've allowed the government to teach your kids. So don't complain when you don't like what the kids are learning because it's your job, parents, to teach your kids. What's really sad is how many kids, let's be honest, now that it's May, you put this in neutral. And now when it comes August, what parent teachers, what you've got to do for the first couple of months, you've got to go back and remember what we've learned because the parents are not doing their job over the summer. We got to regurgitate. I was, my mom was telling me how she used to feed me and get me used to solid food. She would take a little piece of chicken, put it in her mouth and chew it up and then give it to me. She said, I used to love it. I know this ain't a good sermon topic right before lunch and all, but <laughs> yuck. How many of you did that as parents? See, some of you did that. You're disgusting. <laughs> but you know, we do that, and that's what affiliated faith is. We're going to see a little bit later, all you're doing with your affiliated faith, you're just regurgitating what somebody else told you. There comes a point in time in your faith walk where you've got to take the training wheels off, and it becomes yours. What do you believe? Here's how you know if it's affiliated faith. If you believe what you believe because somebody else told you that's what you need to believe, that's affiliated faith. Some of you have affiliated beliefs because that's what the TV told you to believe. Affiliated faith can be very easily manipulated. The next book you read, that's what you're going to believe because that's what that book told you. Brent and I were talking to the neighbor the other day and it was kind of funny because they were kind of, you could tell, you could tell certain people are very sheepish. They believe anything you tell them. And Brent and I could see, oh, this is, we got one on the line here. <laughs> And they said, where are you from? Well, we're from Illinois. And they said, really? I said, yeah, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Illinois boy. Yeah. I said, you know, we went to an auction there. And Brent got a big old smile on his face. I said, yeah. And we bought Abraham Lincoln's original axe. You did? We sure did. The only thing they changed was the head and the handle. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. He caught up. All right. Be very careful if all you stay with is affiliated faith. If all your faith is is spoon-fed, you need to grow past that. It's a very good starting place. We need to do that with our kids and young Christians. Have everyone here has been led to the Lord by somebody. But sooner or later, you've got to go past the spoon-feeding. Sooner or later, it's got to become yours. You need to be able to answer these questions. Do I believe what I believe because somebody else told me? Well, that's a good starting point. But you know, mom and dad could have made a mistake. You know, I love Charles Spurgeon's, but I don't love everything that he writes. He's got a lot of good points, but there's some things I don't agree with. I like C.S. Lewis, but I don't agree with everything he says. I like a lot of these guys that write. I like a lot of their stuff. I like Billy Graham, but I don't agree with everything Billy Graham says. But I've not yet found something in the Word of God that I disagree with. Everything we believe needs to go back to the book. Why do I believe what I believe? What evidence? What proof? What is, what is the supporting factors that I have? And at the same time, here's something else that we need to say is what Paul says in Romans 14. Accept those who are weak in the faith. Our job, who, who, those who are stronger or mature, our job is to come alongside those who are weaker, gently guiding them to another level. And you know, when Paul wrote this, he was talking about the Jewish Christians 
because the Jewish Christians were stuck with the law for so long, and because they had to follow the law, they couldn't understand freedom. They couldn't understand the idea of freedom in Christ. And when they saw these Gentiles eating meat sacrificed to idols, they didn't have a problem with it. It was cheaper. The Gentiles, the Jewish Christians were going, ah, I can't have a problem with that. He said, you Gentiles accept that. And and go ahead and let them in there. And and this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 when he's talking about love and, and talking about the beginning makeup of the church. You know, when you're a child and you don't have the whole thing connected yet, You reason with what you got. But when you understand and your understanding becomes fuller, you start reasoning like an adult. And then when you start reasoning like an adult, you don't have an excuse excuse to act childish anymore. So as we mature with our faith, and our responsibility with those around us is to get them into a searching faith. Man, there's something good. and, And man, I remember watching my boys learn their first memory work and learn and study the, the, how to pray. And it was so neat to, to, you ever noticed that the first prayer that you haven't prayed at night, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep for if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord. Why would we say that with a little kid and then I expect him to stay in bed? <laughs> you ever think about that? That is one, if I die before I wake, all right, now go to sleep. <laughs> if you don't, the boogeyman's going to get you. Isn't that the scariest thing to tell a kid? But then, just the other day, sit down with my boys and actually have a, an in-depth conversation about the Bible. And I'm sitting back as a dad going, man, that is really cool watching them grow towards now their own faith. And I'm moving my hands off of it. And it's their faith. So what is, in in our job, I don't want to pick on anybody. My responsibility, I want you to see where your faith is and maybe look at the person next to you and not pick on them, but say, hey, how can I come alongside you and help you mature to the next level, to a searching faith, then to a solidifying faith, and then where your faith is mature? Because let me tell you what, as I was studying this, I don't think we're years away from the second coming of Christ. I don't think it's years. I think we're down to days. I think we're down to days because of how quickly we're willing to turn away from what we know to be solid evidence of what God expects of us. And as you grow in your faith, you're going to see that there are things that he says we're responsible. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ, if we believe the word of God, not only are we given heaven, we're responsible for things here on this earth. We're responsible to let other people know, hey, If your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, let me tell you about the other side of that coin. There is an all-loving God who loves you, but if you don't accept his love, he is also a God of all wrath. The God who spoke on heaven warned you about hell because he loves you. The first way you can identify someone who has an affiliating faith is their prayer life, and you can learn a lot about someone how they pray. You can learn a lot about a young Christian and how they pray. And, and I remember when I first started praying, and I didn't know how to pray. And the Bible teaches us how to pray. And that's one of the things the, the apostles asked about was when they saw Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray the right way. And a young Christian, and, and one of the things that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 is, don't be repetitious. And then when you're repetitious, he says in Matthew chapter 6, he, first off, he says this, don't go over here and draw attention to yourself. He wasn't talking against public prayer, but what he's saying was if you're praying so that you can get attention, that's wrong, and you've received your reward. And what the Pharisees were doing and the religious leaders, they would draw a crowd around them. Come here, I want you to let people see how religious I am. Come here, and I'm going to show you just how holy I am. Now, the Pharisees, were they theologians? Oh, yeah. Were they intellectuals? Oh, yeah. But they didn't have a faith. And then he says, don't be repetitious like the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would just pray something over and over and over and over again, thanking the repetition. It is not some kind of a magic spell. He says that in verse 7, and then he gives us the model prayer after that. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give me today my daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. I forgive those who trespass against us. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. He didn't say to repeat that. That's the saying he said not to do in verse 7. Now, if you want to re- repeat it, but if you're going to say it from your heart, not from your head. There are times that in the Bible that I pick certain chapters, and that's what I feel. And I'm going to pray that. There are times that I have prayed Psalms 22. God, why have you rejected me? That's what I feel, God, right there. But it's not from my head alone, it's from my heart. God doesn't want to hear a repetition. He wants to hear from you. You're his son, you're his daughter. When you're growing in your faith, he wants a conversation. He's your dad. It's like you're picking up the phone and your dad's going, hey daughter, how you doing today? And you know what you can say? You're, you're thinking it anyway. Hey, Dad, life stinks right now. I ain't making it. I need you to pick up my pieces. I feel broken. That's a conversation. He wants a conversation because you're in a relationship and you understand that you're in a relationship with him. And you understand that you can go outside the natural Because you have a God that's outside the natural. And that shows that you're maturing. And it's not just affiliated faith. You can go outside the, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You can go outside the, Lord, thank me. Thank you for this food. Which we'll need to do that. But we need to go outside the natural realm. And that's when it takes courage. That's when it takes guts. Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know. How, in the natural order of things, you're going to accomplish what I'm asking. But I know this is how you work best. And I'm taking courage because I know sometimes you're not going to answer these. But that's what I'm asking you to do. Also, the next thing is, it takes, they have trouble with change. Um, Another word for affiliation is familiar. Familiar. And somebody who has an affiliated faith doesn't like anything that's not familiar. Whenever you're trying to change paint in a church, you're trying to change carpeting, you're trying to change chairs, or, or maybe you're trying to change from uh, uh, pews, or trying to change from a hymnal to writing on the wall. I remember when our church went from that, and we got people so mad, we had people leave the church over technology. I'm like, are you kidding me? I remember when we went from having the organ and we decided to go with the guitar and we had somebody that got, that got mad over that because I guess in the Bible, organ is, is Greek or something. or I don't know. I guess Jesus played an organ. David must have played an organ. He drug out around everywhere he went. I, I guess it's a holy instrument or something. I don't know. I remember when we were having a discussion on where to put the communion table and we had people upset about that. I'm like, well, where'd Jesus put it? You're not going to find that scripture. I remember when we were trying to figure out who should serve communion. Well, who served it in the Bible? You're not going to find that scripture. But people will fight over that. And it's, it's, it's amazing that we'll fight over things that we assume that's in the Bible. And change. And, and even they get threatened with biblical sound change. And, and Here's the thing, when you're growing in your faith, you know what you're going to find out? There are sins in your life that you've got to get rid of. And when you're growing in your faith, that's some of the hardest things you've got to do is get rid of those sins. You've got to move. And, and even biblically sound changes when the elders say, hey, we're going to make some decisions here because we feel that if we go this direction, we're going to be able to reach us, these people, and we want to make these changes. And even those changes cause problems. The Pharisees were opposed to change, even though that he proved that he was the king. They were opposed to it. Matthew ch- or Mark chapter 2, they come up to him, and every time Jesus wanted to make a change, they fought it all the way through it. How many of you have ever read something in the Bible, and you heard the Holy Spirit speaking to you and says, hey, you need to work on this? Anybody ever, am I the only one that ever read a passage of scripture, and it, it, it worked on my heart, and, and, you know, how many of you ever, how many of you ever had your wife move furniture around in your house 
and you, you, you had trouble with that change. Let me tell you what, I, I stubbed my toe for like a week because she moved furniture around. I hate Christmas at our house because I don't know where my chair is. There are times I don't know where to put my coffee because I have this little table in our living room. Don't tell Vicky, but every morning that's where my coffee goes. But it's not supposed to because it's some kind of an antique or something. But my coffee goes on that table every morning until she gets up. Then I hold it. <laughs> I'll admit it. I'm scared of her. <laughs> I should be. Change. We don't like change. Let's admit it. How many of you remember when air conditioning was an option in cars? How many of you remember when windows were an option? Some of you remember. How many of you remember when a car was an option for transportation? All right. We don't like change. The Pharisees hated change. Even when Jesus said change has to happen because the new covenant has to come in. And he was arguing with them over Mark 2. How come, you're a, how come you guys don't fast? He's like, because it's not appropriate time to fast. Because I'm here. When I leave, they will fast. You don't put an old, uh, you don't put a new uh, um, patch on old, old clothing, do you? You don't put new wine in old wineskin, do you? You don't do this. When change happens, it's got to happen. We all want to go back to the old way. We talk about that. Oh, you know, we need to go back. We want to go back to normal. Go back to normal. Let me tell you something. <laughs> if COVID didn't happen, we wouldn't realize change was always happening. Change has always taken place. John chapter 4 talks about the woman at the well. She needed a change. And Jesus says she needs to come to Jesus' moment. And Jesus waited on her. And Jesus looked at her and says, you need to change. Not only did he meet her where she was at, and he called her out and said, this is what your life is like, and you can't have happy until you change. It hit her so hard that she went back into town, the people she was afraid of, dropped her water bucket, the reason she was even there in the first place, ran to the people she was embarrassed about and called their attention and said, you got to come meet this man. And it first says, by her words, they believed. That's affiliated faith. They believed because she talked to him about it. That's affiliated faith. They ran out to meet him, and then it says, we first believed because of what you said. Now we believe because we heard it firsthand. That's when it becomes searching faith. First we believe because you said something. Now we believe it because we searched it out for ourselves. You can tell affiliated faith by their comments. They just repeat what somebody else said. I always think it's funny about people when they go off to college. How many of you ever heard somebody that go off to college that come back and they're, they're, they're experts at everything? They know everything. My professor said this and my professor said that. You just smile about it. Because the next year, some other professor is going to say something. And what I found out about professors, a lot of them have never had a real job. Never had a real ministry. They never had a real... You know, I was going to uh, college to become a diesel mechanic. I went up to my mechanic that was teaching me about all this mechanic and stuff. And I said, how long have you worked in the field? Well, I'm just a professor. Oh. They just repeat what somebody else had said. I, I like the story about... Acts 19, they're all upset in Ephesus because they're coming here teaching this strange stuff and people aren't buying all these different trinkets anymore about Artemis. And all of a sudden, they start chanting and they don't know why they're chanting and they're all up in an uproar and they're looking around going, why are we chanting? All right, everybody loves Artemis. Everybody loves Artemis. Why are we doing this? They're just sheep. They're just repeating. There are people all upset in our world, in America today, chanting and mad at everybody else. What are you mad about? Because they told me to be. They don't know why. They just repeat. But as we mature and as you grow in Christ, not only do you get patient, but your speech gets words of wisdom. I wasn't going to say this, but I've already used the illustration, so I'm going to say it. Do you know what you call when somebody repeats something? We call that regurgitating. All they're doing, there is no power behind that. They're just saying something that somebody else said, and they don't know why they said it. And when you ask them why they come to that conclusion, they don't know why. You get time, go home and read Proverbs chapter 2, and it says when we get closer to God, we get wisdom from that. I 
I want to give you a side note. I found this yesterday. And I'm like, man, I wish I would have found this earlier. I would have put it in my notes. And so I just wrote it down. It says this. Burnout occurs when a person is taking on a responsibility that they're spiritually not mature enough for. Why should we grow in our faith? Because you're going to be a parent someday, hopefully. And that takes spiritual maturity. Why should we grow in our faith? Because you're supposed to lead someone else to the Lord, and that's going to take spiritual maturity. You need to be a leader. Hebrews 5 says you need to be a leader yourself, so that takes spiritual maturity. You're going to take on a role, leadership role in the society. That takes spiritual maturity. And if you don't grow in your faith, you're going to burn out yourself. And our job and responsibility is to look around and we see somebody else, and if they're dying out, our job is to restoke that fire. And if we see somebody hurting, we need to come alongside them and pick them back up. If Jesus did to you what he did to his apostles, one night as he's sitting there and he's looking at his apostles and he asked two important questions. Who does the crowd say that I am? And they're, oh, well, and it's, it's an easy question when you, when you think about it because it's not about me, it's about everyone else. Oh, some people say you're Elijah. Some say John the Baptist back from the dead. You know, that's a good question. We could ask that question today. Who does society say Jesus is? Well, some say he's a prophet. Some say he was a good teacher. That's an easy, because there's nothing on me when they ask that question. But then he looks at his apostles, the ones who've been with him. And he goes, but who do you say that I am? And some of them were afraid to answer that question but they're thinking about it and they're going, hmm, that puts a lot on me. And Peter just speaks up and says, well, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. Let me ask you this. What do you say about God? What's your evidence? Who's Jesus? To you. What about the Word of God? What about the Bible? What about heaven? What about hell? What about your responsibility as a Christian to the society you live in? What about church? If Jesus were to ask you, why don't we just do that? As we're singing this song, answer this question as if Jesus was asking you. So who do you say that I am? How would you answer that? How have you been living it? Let's stand and sing.
This is Justin and Amanda and their daughters, Frank and Fred, right? No, 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 okay. Won't you introduce your family to us? Uh, this is Brecklin and this is Hope. Hope and Brecklin and, and Hope is six and Brecklin is three. And then, yeah, going on 16 right here, so, <laughs> yeah. All right, they're going to be out in the hall. If you want to meet and ask them any questions, you can. Uh, I want you guys to go ahead and go back there. And that's naturally curly hair, just like her dad's, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, we was having the meeting, and I, I said, he's going to meet everybody with bald heads. I mean, he met Lucas and a couple other people. I'm like, he's going to think everyone, you moved to Norton, and they just shaved their head or something. So I think we're a cult or something like that. So uh, if you're a guest today, go meet Garrett. He has the gift for you. All right, now we have, um, now we, we announced about your grand, your, your baby, Doyle, your dad had to announce that because you didn't do that. As a new dad, I'm a little disappointed. I mean, so, you want to, anything you want to say? Say what? He's an awesome kid. He's the best kid you've ever had. Takes after you? Takes after you. All right, all right, all right. Sing us out of here. Will you do that? Let everything.